to your the next speaker, who's actually a co-author on this paper, um, Susan Waters, um, who's from the same area, I believe. And um, her talk is uh, prescribed fire in grassland restoration is associated with increased plant pollinator community resilience to plant species losses. Um, great, thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm really happy to be speaking to such a, an international audience, super fun. And thank you so much to the organizers. I would like to just start by acknowledging my co-author, Rachel Mitchell of the University of Arizona. Um, so I work on grassland restoration and um, how restoration affects plant pollinator communities. And I typically work in sites that look a lot like the site in the picture. They're very depauperate plant communities, typically dominated by invasive plants. You see in um, non-native grasses and forbs in this picture. And they have concomitantly depauperate pollinator communities. So you have a really simplified structure of interactions and that uh, community that's susceptible to effects of further species losses. And you can imagine in this picture that if this dandelion-like flower were lost from this landscape, that there would be very little to forage on for bees. Um, so restoration in the sites where I work is often carried out using two, um, two processes that are complementary to each other. One is the use of prescribed fire to prepare sites. And the second is the use of seeding and replanting or, or plugging of seedlings of native forbs to reintroduce native forb diversity to a site. And the aim of these two actions is of course, first and foremost, usually the, the stated goal is to promote plant diversity and abundance, but hopefully concomitantly, it's also increasing pollinator diversity and abundance. And we have some evidence that both of these things are in fact happening. So you can see a, a pretty diverse set of forbs on the left side and a little, glimpse of our just of our osmia diversity to sort of represent um, represent that on the right side. So we know that these restoration actions are in fact changing plant composition. They are in fact changing pollinator composition. But as I'm sure everybody in this audience knows, um, that's not all that happens, right? You change plant, plant richness and composition, you change pollinator richness and composition. You also get this emergent effect, which is a change in the community structure, the way that players are interacting with each other and the consequent community function. And the function that I'm particularly interested in in our prairies is resilience to future species losses. Um, the reason why I think it's important to care about resilience of restored plant pollinator communities is because we can expect that there definitely will be future plant species losses for two major reasons. The first one, as in the picture shown on the left, is that we have people out there who are working very hard to deliberately remove plant species from the landscape, and they're quite successful at doing so. In other words, people are out there trying to control invasive plants. This is a, a necessary action in these prairies as we reintroduce native plants, but it also means that some of the plants that are providing the majority of floral resources on the landscape, in other words, very invasive forbs, are actually being actively and constantly removed. So we can expect that plant species law, loss, at least on a temporary basis. On the right-hand picture, you see um, the Willamette daisy that Scott just spoke about as a representative of one of the many rare and endangered plant species that occur in the prairies that I work in. And of course, with climate change and other global environmental changes, we can expect stochastic losses of rare plants. And so for both of these reasons, it's very interesting to wonder what happens in our restored communities, our quote, restored communities when species are lost. And that brings me to the question that structures my talk, which is, does the restructuring of communities by burning and replanting, in other words, by restoration, does this restructuring increase resilience to plant species losses of the future? Um, our, I'll talk about our methods. So I work in the Cascadia Prairies. It's a similar setting to the, to the one that Scott spoke about in the previous talk. It's in the upper left-hand corner of North America. You can see in the right-hand map there, the extent historically of the prairies 
from the state of Oregon north through the state of Washington into British Columbia. I work in Western Washington prairies. And these are highly fragmented prairies with many preserves under restoration via prescribed fire and the replanting that I mentioned. So we have been following a, a set of six prairie sites that represent a gradient of restoration. So these are sites that range from when we started the study um, from zero years of prior fire and replanting history up to 15 prior years of fire and replanting. We followed those six sites for four years, um, collecting data on plant pollinator interactions. And that data included floral composition and density. It also included 30 minutes of patch focused observation on every flowering forb at the site. And of course we captured and identified floral visitors. And we used that information to build plant pollinator networks. And you've seen networks in, in several talks in this conference, but just as a reminder, I'll show you some images like this. The black bars across the bottom represent plant species. The black bars across the top represent pollinator species and a line connecting the two indicates um, that those species were witnessed interacting with each other in the field. And so we built networks for each site and year of our study. At the same time, we also collected um, spatially explicit fire and replanting records so that we were able to create variables, um, uh, two major variables, the cumulative burning, uh, sorry, the proportion of the site that was burned over the previous 10 years and the proportion of the site that had been replanted over the previous 10 years. And so we were able to associate fire and replanting with the structures of these networks. We also used our networks to model the potential impacts of plant loss or removal. And to do that, we used a system, an approach called total effects stochastic coextinction modeling, pioneered by Perez et al. in 2020. And this approach um, takes a network and characterizes all of the possible direct and indirect pathways of interaction between plants and insects in the network. And then those pathways are parameterized by three things, by the frequency of interactions that we observed in the field, and then by metrics that represent pollinator dependence on floral nutrition, and plant dependence for each species on, on um, reproduction from insect pollination. So I can talk later about how we got those values if you're interested, but we do have um, representative values for the players in our, our network. And so then the idea is that we perturb this network that we've parameterized with all this information and measure the size of the resulting co-extinction cascade or the secondary species losses. And um, what we did was to model six different um, removal scenarios or plant loss scenarios. The first three we consider to be control scenarios. And so here's a network and I've highlighted some plants in red along the bottom there, starting at the right hand side there, you see three that I've used to represent random removal. So our first scenario was randomly removing plants from the network and looking at the results of how that ramified through the network, the secondary co-extinctions. The sec, what we compare to that also, what would happen if you remove the plant with the highest degree, that's the plant that is, has the most direct insect partners as represented there. You can see all the lines coming out of that central red rectangle. We also removed the plant with the lowest degree. And what we expected here was that random removal would be intermediate. Removing a plant of high degree would have a strong impact on the network and low degree would have a low impact. So we used, those were our three controls. Then we also model three management relevant scenarios. So here's an imaginary a field of flowers. Um, we uh, removed the dominant exotic forb as I, I represented by the red circle on the top there. Then we also removed the top noxious weed. And in North America, the distinction between top noxious weed and top exotic forb is just that the noxious weeds are required by law to be removed. And so there's a close relationship, but they're not the same thing. Then we also modeled the removal or loss of the rarest native forb in a system. And so again, that's representing the stochastic potential losses. And in each case, we're looking at how this removal affects the insects involved and then how that carries on to further affect plants. 
we modeled each scenario, uh, we simulated each scenario 500 times. And so here's some of our results. So first I'll just show you some examples of some of the networks. Prescribed fire and replanting increased the network size and complexity for sure. This is um, two of our sites from year one. On the left, you see a, a network from a site with no fire or replanting history. Again, plants across the bottom, insects across the top. On the right hand side, you see what year one, a high fire and replanting history site looked like. So more complicated. Um, again, we follow these sites for four years. In year four, you can see that the low fire site has increased in complexity, but the high fire history site continued to increase in complexity. Even though it started out at a relatively high level of complexity, these restoration treatments continued to increase that complexity through time. So we definitely are having reorganization of these networks in response to fire and replanting. So let's return to the basic question. Does this restructuring actually increase resilience to plant species losses? And the answer is yes. Prescribed fire promoted resilience in all the plant species loss scenarios. Here are the three control scenarios, highest degree forb removed, random forb removed, and lowest degree forb removed with f increasing fire along the bottom of the X axis and cascade size or species loss on the Y axis. And you can see that in every case, as fire increases over time, the impact of removing a species decreases. In other words, resilience is increasing. And as we predicted, the effect is highest when you remove a high degree for intermediate with random and low with a low degree for. Um, now here are the actual management scenarios. And this is where we had an unexpected result. Now we expected that removing a dominant exotic forb or a top noxious weed would have very strong effects because these are typically, these are certainly highly visited flowers. We see them visited all the time and they're incredibly abundant. We expected uh, um, on, on the opposite end that removing a rare native forb would have a low effect because they're because they're rare. Um, on the contrary, we found that the rarest native forb removals had effects that were almost as strong as removing a high degree forb. And, and the impact was strongest when the site had a low history of fire and restoration. So this was a very interesting result that we did not expect at all. And so just to restate, Rare native forbs can play an outsized role in sustaining plant pollinator networks, especially in degraded sites. Our next steps here are to look at what combination of floral traits, density, and community context is associated with causing these rare forbs to have such a strong effect. We think that they're probably um, having that effect because they have floral traits that are not offered by the other species in these depauperate sites. We also want to ask how burning and replanting might affect resilience to pollinator losses. And so with that, um, I want to thank all my funding organizations, my wonderful field and lab crew, my wonderful taxonomy crew, and take your questions. And I apologize for the dog barking in the background. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for a very interesting study. Um, and I'll echo Lawrence's uh, Lance Packer's comment that it's uh, very interesting and somebody else says very cool research. Rowan said, do the rare forbs have specialist pollinators or are there generalists being lost in the species loss cascades? Great question. No, there are definitely generalists involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting. So what's happening is that the, what's happening is that the forbs um, are, to put it in a sort of soft, <laughs> um, non-technical way, the uh, the forb the native forbs are proving to be what I would call more deeply connected within the networks. They have longer pathways of both direct and indirect connect connections through the networks. So we have a, it turns out that a lot of our exotic forbs are just have just as many partners. In other words, they have a similar degree, perhaps species degree, but the pathways that connect them to other organisms in the network are shorter. So it's a it's a surprising and interesting result. Wonderful. Um, Rowan also says it's very 
cool to see the tracking of restoration over time, which Thank I you. will second and third. Thank you. So we don't have time for any more questions. So thank you very much.